Um, we are so thrilled for those of you who are here in the room and of course joining us online, um, many more. And we're thrilled tonight to be uh, joined by Lynn Good, who's Chairman, President, and CEO of Duke Energy, also the new, newly elected Chairman of the Edison Electric Institute. And she is here for a conversation about trends affecting the energy industry and challenges to the industry. Uh, just a social media reminder, please follow us on Twitter. We're at Smart Women. And also, please check out our Smart Women podcast series and iTunes U course. If you're live tweeting, please use uh, hashtag CSIS live. Um, our Smart Women, Smart Power speaker series wouldn't be possible without the support of City. And in the interest of transparency, I should mention that Duke is a client of City's. Thank you so much to City for helping us to amplify the voices of women in foreign policy, national security, and international business. And here to talk a little bit about uh, City and the efforts they have underway, uh, please join me in welcoming Candy Wolf, who's the Executive Vice President, Global Government Affairs at City. Please, Candy. Good evening, everyone, and thank you, Kathleen. Uh, and I want to thank you all for joining us for another in our series of Smart Women, Smart Power um, as guests and speakers. We've been really honored to be able to um, sponsor this series for the past, are we three years, I think? Three years uh, since it kicked off. And it really gives us an opportunity to bring women leaders uh, in foreign policy and national security and in the business uh, community to discuss so many of the issues facing our world today. And it's um, important from a city perspective because we're in 100 countries around the globe and our footprint really offers us a diverse perspective on all of the issues that are arising around the world. And as we have to try to learn to confront them uh, in our mission to provide financial services and enable growth and economic progress, it's so important to hear from all the different leaders around how they're addressing the issues and how we can all work together to, to both understand what we're facing and then, and then uh, determine how to move forward. So well, I'm very fortunate today to have Lynn Good here um, as the chairman, the president, and the CEO, as Kathleen said, of Duke Energy for what's going to be a fascinating conversation around energy challenges and opportunities and I was uh, saying to Lynn and I see Tom over here I said is Tom still doing this uh, all of this work uh, in EI and uh, I spent before joining financial services I spent some time in energy and so um, it's something that I do have some familiarity about and so I'm looking forward to this conversation um, as uh, Kathleen said, uh, Duke is ha a client of cities, as I discovered. It's not something I am familiar with, but I did call up and say, <laughs> is Duke a client? And they said, yes, an important one. I said, okay. Um, but more importantly, I think, um, and as we talk and have this conversation, it'll be around issues with respect to renewable and sustainability. And Duke and Lynn um, have been at the forefront of the um, sustainab their sustainability commitment, and it's something that has made a commitment to. And so um, I think um, you may know that Lynn played a big role before she became CEO in leading Duke's um, commercial energy business and its development of renewable energy projects. So I think it's something we'll look forward to having that conversation. Finally, um, I want to thank Nina for always hosting our guests and uh, for being such a, a great interviewer uh, for the Smart Women, Smart Power series. And with that, thank you all for attending. And back over to Kathleen. Uh, for those who don't know, Duke Energy is one of America's largest energy holding companies. Before becoming CEO, Lynn Good was the company's chief financial officer, and earlier in her career, she was a partner at two separate accounting firms, including a career with Arthur Anderson. As uh, Candy mentioned, uh, we're being moderated tonight by our, by our very esteemed CSIS senior associate, Nina Easton. Nina is also the chair of Fortune's Most Powerful Women International Summit, and she's the co-chair of the Fortune Global Forum. Bear with us a moment while we remove the podium, and then we're going to turn it over to Nina for a great conversation. Thank you both. Very good. Thank you. Thank you, Kath. Um, as you're removing the podium, I would also like to thank City for your incredible support. Candy, it's great to have you guys here and, and cheering us on in this important program. Um, so, Lynn, I guess we will wait for the podium to move. 
Lynn, we like to always on stage here start with a little bit of the personal get to know you before we sure. dive into issues. And by the way, in the audience, uh, I'm going to be talking at a pretty 36,000 foot level. I know a lot of you here are serious, uh, serious thinkers about the subject that we're about to talk about. So please have your questions ready. We'll start collecting them about halfway through, and I'll go ahead and ask them. So. It's interesting, coming from Fortune Most Powerful Women, that uh, so few women are CEOs. We, uh, we lost, let's see, we, we, had, we had an all-time high of 32 last year. We were down to 24. Um, it's a tiny percent, obviously. Uh, and I, we don't need to go into the where's, why's, and how's of that. But when you were growing up in Ohio, uh, the daughter of a math teacher became a principal. Did you expect to be a CEO? Uh, no. <laughs> that is such an easy one. Um, so I grew up in a simple, hard-working home where there was a lot of focus and attention on doing well in school. And uh, there was a lot of math that ran through my family, so I guess I had a STEM education, although we didn't call it STEM. Right? That's Were a you a natural in math? Term. Was that... So there was a lot of math. And you're yes. natural. That, that came that was to you naturally. Thing. Yes. Well, thing. you know, it's interesting. So I'm, a fa I'm from a family of two girls. And my sister, who's uh, five years older than I am, is just an extraordinary artist. Huh. So watercolor, um, you know, uh, pastels, uh, oil paint. She's a sculptor. And then there's me. And there's you. So I, I can't draw a thing. You know, everything has to be at noon. It's a stick figure. There's no shading. There's, <laughs> I, you know, she just sees the world differently than I do. But uh, I would rival her on the math. Right, so math wasn't her thing, but math was my thing. So in our, you know, genealogy, someone got the left brain and someone got the right brain. Exactly divided, yes, it sounds like. Yes, yes, which makes for an interesting family. But you, did you have an ambition to go into business? So I had an ambition to uh, do something great, and you know, my father had a big influence on me. Um, so my father, World War II veteran, first generation college. Um, he was a math. Uh, major, which you referenced, Nina, and I was the first woman in my family that uh, did not pursue teaching or nursing, and mm -hmm. those are both incredibly honorable professions. But my father said, "Lynn, you've got all this math and all this, you know, science. Why don't why don't you uh, try something different?" And so we sat there with the college catalog, and we picked computer science, which today sounds like what a great idea. Yeah, in the <laughs> In the late 70s, when I didn't, you know, early 80s, I had never programmed that a computer. Not, and that no. was not a top of mind no, subject no, to major no. in. Yeah. And so I became a computer science major and um, actually um, took some business courses and ended up finishing um, a finance or accounting degree and got a CPA at some, uh, at some point. And I started at Arthur Anderson from that background. And so I had my second airplane ride of my life when I went to training at Arthur Anderson. Wow. So, um, so I want to get anyway. to Arthur Anderson in a second, but you, um, do you ever look at Silicon Valley with your computer science degree and say, why am I not there? <laughs> not really. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I love the Carolinas. Uh, and you know, it's been such a long time since I've done something like that. I think my sons, who are you know the early twenty-somethings, would say, "Really? She yeah. knew something about technology?" Oh, that's interesting. Um, but uh, anyway, but, but you're running a high-tech business, yes, to, yes. as we'll we'll discuss in a minute. So, it's 2002. Your careers at Arthur Anderson is going just fine. You're just kind of moving up the ladder, and suddenly Enron happens. Remember Enron? <laughs> uh, and Arthur Anderson is indicted by the Justice Department. Um, your job is gone. And you're having to take a job eventually, I think, with an Arthur Anderson client at half the salary. And you lost all your, most of your savings. So what, what happened? It was, uh, that was a crazy time. So Enron was going bankrupt in late 2001. So think about 9-11. So you think about that yeah. period in 2001, there were a lot of crazy things going on. And Anderson uh, was indicted in March of 2002, and the firm was indicted, not an individual. I had never worked a day on Enron. I was based in the Midwest. And you know, this firm of over 100,000 people basically disbanded over the course of about 
six, seven weeks from wow. mid-March to the, my first day at Deloitte & Touche was, I think, May 2nd. And the indictment came down like the 17th of March. And so um, it was an interesting, uh, I've told this story many times, but there was an all-partner phone call at midnight on the night before the indictment was going to become public to inform the partners that the firm was going to be indicted. And so Brian Good, my husband, dutifully waited up with me. You know, I got the sympathy vote from him that night. And as soon as he hears um, the firm's going to be indicted, he looks at me and he goes, Lynn, it's over. And he goes to bed and leaves me on the telephone, <laughs> uh, mourning with the rest of the thousands of people who were mourning. And so I got up the next morning and called Pricewaterhouse, Deloitte, and a few others and thought, I've got to move. Um, because it's like, you know, a professional service firm that's indicted. I mean, basically all you're selling is your integrity and your people. Yeah. And I felt like the firm was going to do this pretty rapidly. So Did I, you lose savings in this? Well, you, I was an equity partner, yeah. so you lost your equity. Uh -huh. So what lessons did you learn through that period about facing a, a traumatic incident like that and kind of starting over? Sure. You learn to keep going. You have to keep going. And um, I would get in, in, so all of those feelings about it's not fair, I had nothing to do with this, why did they indict the firm, mm -hmm. all of the logical human questions that you would ask yourself, it sort of didn't matter yeah. because there were no satisfying answers to any of those right then and you couldn't wait for an answer. You needed to keep moving. And so there was, you learned great resilience um, as a result of that. And you know, there was also, after I got settled, I went to Deloitte & Touche, which is a fine firm, but I moved again within a year. And I think the other thing that wasn't as obvious that it taught me was it's okay to keep moving. Hmm. Um, you know, um, approach your work with some independence. And, if, and flexibility. And flexibility. It's not nim being nimble, particularly. In yeah, so your instance. worth is you. It's yeah. not who you work for, because right. who you work for can disappear. And you, and you were working for a very prestigious firm that was yes. gone and indicted. So yeah. uh, you keep going. Yeah. And so I kept going. So your career um, obviously has done you well since then. Uh, you're a, a CEO of this company that is not only a high-tech company, but as Candy said, very much on the forefront of sustainability and really pushing the boundaries in a lot of areas. Let's start talking about that. As, uh, let's talk about that at first. Um, the grid. Most average people think of the grid as poles and wires, uh, and yet we also hear this talk of a smart grid. Where is this country on that? Sure. So the grid, it is poles and wires, and uh, a lot of things that are underground that you don't see, a lot of connections to power plants that probably aren't visible to you as well. And I would describe it as the lifeblood of the power system. It is the thing we are counting on for reliable power. It's the thing that connects you to a source of power in a way that provides the reliability that, that you count on. I would also say that that grid has more demands on it today than it ever has as we think about new technologies, as we think about new expectations for information about how energy is consumed and produced, as we think about cyber and physical attacks uh, that could impact that important infrastructure. And so the importance of investing in that infrastructure to keep pace with all of the transformation that's going on in this industry is really important. And that's a keen focus at Duke Energy. It's a keen focus of the industry in general so that we can transform to deliver the you know, reliable power that our customers count on. So take us inside the grid and what is a smart grid? Give us that's a specific- That's a big, big word that I'm, can mean exactly. lots of things. So yes. give us some specific examples and then where sure. do you see us in five years, 10 years on sure. that? Sure. So if you think about the way the grid was constructed, it was constructed over decades to electrify uh, the US. And it was constructed for the utility company to generate power and deliver it to you. Kind of a one-way highway. Yeah. And a smart grid today can do so much more than that. So if you want information about how much energy that you're using, we can put smart devices in your home. Uh, an automated meter that mm -hmm. has the technology to keep track of how much energy you're consuming. Our customers care deeply about when there is an outage, why has there been an outage, what information can we have about when our power can be restored. So that requires some intelligence on that grid to figure out where the power outage is, 
who all is affected, to give us the information we need to estimate time of recovery. Also, some smart technology to sectionalize that grid, to minimize the number of people are out. So when a, when a tree comes down, not the whole neighborhood is out, can I sectionalize it so fewer people are affected? That, that's a smart technology. So how far along are we on that? I think it's, it's progressing and modernizing. So at, at Duke, we see an opportunity to do a lot of investment around the grid to accomplish this transformation that we're all counting on. Another thing I'd point to, Nina, is a smart grid to accept more renewable power, to allow that power to flow two directions. Yeah. So someone who self-generates can send to me, and so I can send to them when they are not self-generating. And so there's been a lot of work that's gone on really over the last three or four or five years around the grid, but I think there's so much more to do. That's actually pretty recent. It is. I mean, are we late to the game on this? I don't know that we're late to the game, because you think about all of the transformation that we're talking about. It's been about the last yeah. you know, five or six years, yeah. maybe. Um, it's hard to pinpoint it exactly. Um, but I see over the next decade more investment in the grid relatively than any other part of the, of the you know, s supply chain of electricity. So what would a super smart grid look like in 10 years? I think a super smart grid enables a customer experience that's more customized, uh, enables more information, enables uh, more distributed uh, generation of power, enables an electric vehicle fleet that uh, we'll all participate mm -hmm. in. So we're using those batteries and making use of that technology in our homes or in our businesses. So think about the transformation that you're expecting to occur in energy generally, and think about the grid as an enabler of that and an investment that needs to keep pace. Right. And of course, part of that um, innovation is uh, cl cleaner energy. Sure. Um, what did you think about the, um, the EPA's um, decision on the Clean Power Act? You know, regulation like the Clean Power Plan or any regulation coming out of EPA uh, is something that's important to an industry because regulatory certainty is important. And uh, you think about the investments that we make, we're trying to invest in a wise way for 2025, for 2030, for 2035. And so the Clean Power Plan had a number of legal challenges to it. There was uncertainty around the Clean Power Plan in all events. And so as an industry, and at Duke, we were on the path of decarbonizing, even mm. absent the Clean Power Plan, mm. uh, and have been moving aggressively to decarbonize over the last 10 years, uh, and maybe even a little longer than that. So our carbon emissions are down 31% from 2005, headed to 40. And it's been as a result of very strong economic decisions, introducing natural gas and introducing renewables, working with energy efficiency, demand response with our customers. And I think that progress will continue. So, so do you think, I mean, some would argue the political climate has changed about renewables. Do you think companies, I mean, obviously you're continuing down the path. What do you think industry-wide across energy? Um, I think renewables have a tailwind at their back. Uh, I think um, the economics are a tailwind. I think the strong interest in renewables on the part of corporations and smart cities and uh, utilities like mine that are continuing progress around decarbonization. Uh, and you know, we, we look at this frequently and um, we see renewables continuing. In our areas, it's primarily solar, but I look at some of the great work going on in the middle part of the U.S. where wind is such an extraordinary resource. Uh, you see a lot of wind being developed. I think so let's talk going. about each of those. Solar, I mean, it's certainly starting to reach a potential that sort of in some ways oversold a while ago, and then it seems to be now reaching its potential. Where do you see it playing in the menu of energy options? You Nina, know, I think it'll continue to grow. And you know, I'm an advocate for renewables where the resource makes sense. And in the Southeast, it's a sunny place. And so we have a lot of solar in the eastern part of North Carolina, South Carolina, and increasingly in Florida. I mentioned wind in the wind belt. Mm -hmm. We own resources in Wyoming and West Texas and Colorado, places mm -hmm. that are blessed with incredible wind resources. And I think the uh, production will continue. I also think, though, it's important for us to recognize that reliable and affordable power are the expectation of our customers in addition to green and clean. Right. And so at this point, having that diverse set of resources so I can complement solar 
with nuclear and natural gas and other resources to provide 24-7 all-season powers still remains important. Uh, we will continue investing in new technologies, batteries and other things will develop over time, but we also need to keep an eye on diversity in order for us to supply the power that you all count on. And what about nuclear? Uh, do you see that, where do you see that heading? Nuclear is a, is a great topic yeah. and an interesting one. So Duke Energy is either second or third largest operator of nuclear power. If you live in the Carolinas, 50% of your power in 2017 came from nuclear. So carbon-free nuclear mm -hmm. runs all the time. Mm -hmm. Capacity factor 95%. Mm -hmm. And so as I think about the future, and a future where we work on decarbonizing over time, nuclear is an incredibly valuable resource. But do, do you see plants, more plants being built? Do you see it expanding or do you? I think new nuclear is challenged, okay. economically challenged. And we've seen that in my neck of the woods with the cancellation of a plant in South Carolina. Uh, there's a lot of work going on around existing nuclear and trying to maintain what we have. Uh, there's research and development going on with small modular nuclear to see is there another technology that we could introduce. And I think research and development is particularly important in this area. Because I think about Duke and my and our aspirations to continue to decarbonize. If I have to take nuclear out of the equation at some point over the next 20 or 30 years, there is not a technology today that runs 95% of the time that's carbon free. Hmm. That's a good point. Uh, so uh, continuing to keep that nuclear in the mix is important. There could be a technological breakthrough tomorrow or five years from now. Right. But as I look at uh, the diverse resources that we operate, it's extraordinarily important. So just a reminder to our audience, questions, we'll be collecting them momentarily and Keep going. To Lynn, keep going. So let's talk about security, which of course is a, of great interest to this particular audience um, as well as all of us. Uh, I know whenever I talk to anybody about cybersecurity, I've done a lot of cybersecurity interviews, always, always, the greatest fear is the grid. How safe is the grid right now? There's a lot of uh, there's a lot of uh, people who know a lot about this who sure. think we're, we're very vulnerable. You know, Nina, I think the, the message I would leave with all of you is that the energy infrastructure is recognized as critical infrastructure, not only by the industry, but by, uh, you know, the U.S. government. And so we are very closely linked with all of the three-letter agencies that you would expect us to be. We have standards that we comply with. There's an exchange of information that goes on. Uh, sharing uh, threat information and meeting uh, periodically with CEOs and the leaders of the government agencies to make sure that we are tightly linked. We drill together uh, so that we will simulate a cyber attack, a physical attack, a weather event, uh, and work together to ensure that we can bring the system back up. That occurs with frequency. And so it's a, you know, cyber is a real issue that all corporations are dealing with and the government is dealing with. You know, we focus on maintaining these very tight relationships uh, and working as an industry to ensure we can maintain the safety, you know, to the greatest extent possible. We focus on defense in depth. We focus on, um, you know, the right kinds of training for our people. And we also focus on recovery if something happens. So what would, and again, I mean, there are, there's a lot of concern. There's talk that, there, there's talk, there's, uh, officials have mentioned that there's um, Russian hackers who've made some headway in trying to get into our grid. What would it look like if the grid was attacked? So I think it's fair to say that there's hacking and attacks going on in corporate America everywhere. Yeah, it's going on every day, but, but, but my point is it's made progress. I mean, there, that hackers sure. have made some progress in the grid. Sure. So. Um, you know, so the, the vulnerability or the, the, uh, the approach would be, is there a way to take down part of the system, right? right? Is there a way to uh, cause part of the grid to be unreliable or to, you know, black out a certain area? There has been no success on that. Uh, the industry has been very effective in defending against that. Right. And that's the information sharing that has an ongoing role in the industry. And, you know, um, you should think about this industry as being incredibly vigilant. It's a 24-7 operation that we run uh, in close coordination with the government, doing everything that we can 
to maintain the safety of that grid and to recognize that if something happens, our job is to restore as quickly as possible. So if it did, again, if it did go down, people have said it would look like a war zone event. So I, mean, I, I are, think the, is that an exaggeration? I think that's an exaggeration, okay. Nina. I would think about the, the attempt is going to be to try to black something out, to get control of um, you know, a part of the system in a way that might affect electric service. Okay. But you think about our industry, we have parts of our grid impacted by hurricanes. Right. We have parts of our grid impacted by wildfires. So we understand how to restore our grid, how to bring it back uh, if something happens. And that's why, you know, I, I keep going back to drilling and recovery is an important part of the role and that's something we understand very well. And you mentioned storms. We've seen a lot, whether, whether or not that's related to climate change, we've seen a lot of pretty violent storms. What have you learned in the last couple of years? About <laughs> so we had back-to-back uh, -back Hurricane Matthew and Hurricane Irma in my mm -hmm. neck of the woods and supplied resources to Hurricane Harvey. I think every storm has its own character to it, flooding in the case of Harvey. In the case of Irma, we serve um, over 40 counties in Florida. Every one of them was, had damage. Wow. Uh, so if I think back to the hurricanes in 2004 and 2005, they were more targeted, you know, kind of coming through an area, you could see where they were and, um, you know, only parts of the system. So every one is a little bit different. Uh, Matthew had some flooding in the eastern part of North Carolina, and you can't restore power when there's flooding, right? You right. have to wait until the waters recede. So every time that one of these events occurs, our job is after action to figure out how can I strengthen the system uh, to make it better, to learn from it. Um, the other thing I would share, Nina, is our patience for our power being out as consumers, let's just talk about ourselves, is very low. Oh, man. Very low. And I think it's about three days. I think three days without power, and then nothing good is happening. Yeah. So we learned a lot about being engaged on social media, uh, being engaged in a way that we could communicate with customers, and, and we probably had 75 people working social media during Irma. I needed 250. Hmm. So there are learnings like that that have nothing to do with restoring power, but they have a lot to do with meeting expectations of customers. Yeah. And uh, so we're transforming in that way as well. Um, right now, it's hurricane preparation season, and so there's a, a lot of a work. Going. We drill. <laughs> okay. Uh, so, um, you know, you're looking at: uh, Do I have um, sites where I can house people? Do I have the relationships for, uh, you know, tent cities where people live? Do I have all the equipment that I need? Uh, are my mutual assistance arrangements where I can call in other resources available? Uh, what about my communications? What about my systems? Have I tested them for a million and a half people out of power, all of whom are going to be calling me and emailing me uh, so that we can uh, respond in that way? So it's a variety of things. And this year at Duke, we, um, we have approached it maybe a little more aggressively with our own employee base. We've always had volunteerism to help during a storm. So you can have a call center role, a social media role, you can work in an ops center, you can hand out water, you can work logistics. And this year we've made it the year of every employee has a storm role. Oh, every employee. So this gives us an opportunity to have everyone available, working fewer shifts, That's shorter periods of time, but also creating that connection with the Duke employee of how important it is to serve our customers and so we will be there when there's a storm event. Everyone will be there. And you have volunteers who've gone to Puerto Rico. Tell we do. Tell us about that. So the Puerto Rico experience, um, this is following uh, Hurricane Maria. We had a couple of hundred of our line crews from all over the system who actually volunteered to go. But it was part of an industry-wide effort. And I'm looking at Tom Kuhn here in the front row from EEI. We put a lot of resources on the ground in Puerto Rico to, do, to restore power. And um, the conditions were extraordinarily difficult. So I look at the pictures of where our crews were working, the vegetation, the topography of getting large bucket trucks up and down hills, uh, shooting wire across ravines from one pole to another to connect you know, a, a few homes. And so it was an extraordinary experience. The heart of the Puerto Rican people was just unmatched. So 
you know, we had all this, did all this work around lunches and food and so on, and almost every day, the people were in their yard with their grills making food for our linemen. And it was such a spirit of community, uh, and they were so grateful and thankful for um, having the power restored. So it was a heartwarming experience, and uh, the team did a great job. They're back. They spent about two months away from their home um, working in Puerto Rico, but I think it was a great experience overall. And you're saying in, in Puerto Rico, things are pretty much back. Almost, Almost 99 everybody has plus power. percent back. Okay. Oh. What is Duke Energy's commitment to diversity supplier program? Do you have any numbers? You know, I don't have numbers uh, around you know, our supplier diversity, but I would say, though, is diversity and inclusion is incredibly important to Duke Energy. Uh, whether it's in our employees, the contractors, the supply chain. Uh, we want our business to reflect the communities that we serve. And so we look deeply at this um, across the board. And if I would tie it to some of the earlier conversation we've had, Nina, I think this transformation that our industry is undergoing also is a call to action around diversity because we need new thinking. We need mm -hmm. creative thought. We need different points of view at the table, and that's a business case argument for diversity. Right. What is your perspective on carbon capture utilization and storage? I think it's an important area for research and development. Um, and I think about, you know, we um, completed this year at Duke something called a climate report, which uh, is a discussion of how we believe we could achieve a two degree scenario in 2050. We are on path and can see how to get there by 2030, but that period between 2030 and 2050 uh, is where the challenge sits. Yes. What are the technologies that will be available? How will we approach it during that period? And we see a need for something I would call load following carbon free uh, generation. So something what does that, that mean? So the way electricity is produced and consumed is when you use it, I'm producing it. And so um, let's do solar, for example. Uh, solar produces lots of power between, let's say, noon and five o'clock or six o'clock. But then the sun goes down. And something needs to come on because you're not changing your habits on the use of electricity just because the sun is down. So I need something that can fill your appetite for power in the moment you need it. That's what it means to follow the load. The load is you using power. So I need to follow you and produce electricity in the same way. Uh, and so uh, where carbon capture works or could work is it could take a, uh, a gas plant or a coal plant and eliminate the carbon. And those plants have the ability to follow the load. Uh, so I think it's, it's an important area of research and development. We have a plant in Indiana that is capable of, of capturing carbon. Uh, we have not made the investment yet. It's about 100 to $150 million. Uh, but you know, that, that's something that I think is worth study uh, as we think about getting to a two degree scenario. So Elon Musk is planning a smart city where citizens sell back energy to energy companies. How interested are you and other companies in adopting a similar model? You know, I think that's happening already, Nina, uh, with rooftop solar. Yes, and, it's, yeah. and it's happening uh, with industrial companies that are self-generating. Uh, a combined heat and power facility where they could be selling back to us in periods when they're not producing. So there are models like this already working. Uh, all over the U.S. and around the world. Uh, and I think that uh, that's part of this distributed future that we may see. Um, so I think it's already here. How has that affected your bottom line? The so it, uh, I, I don't know that I can quantify affecting bottom line. Uh, what it, when someone self-generates, it means I'm not generating. Exactly. Uh, but I'm still delivering power and I'm still accepting it. So there's still a, a very important relationship on the use of the grid. And uh, that service is a valuable one that our customers pay for. Right. And, you know, I think about this is part of the transformation. Customers who want to self-generate, we need to enable. Mm -hmm. uh, because serving and satisfying and delighting our customers is the work that we do. Right. How many people are you seeing going off-grid? 
I was in the Big Island in Hawaii where there's a big, big communities of people who are going off-grid. It sure looked nice. So I don't <laughs> see a lot of off-grid. Okay. Um, I don't see a lot of off-grid. You don't see that you know, we have built actually uh, a couple of microgrids, so small grids. Uh -huh. um, one is in the western part of North Carolina, which is hard for us to get to because of topography, right? So mountains, think mountains and trees and all kinds of things. So running a single wire out there that can be vulnerable mm -hmm. in weather or from vegetation. We actually have a communication tower that sits out there and we've put solar and battery, cut the wire, and we're serving that communication tower in its own little microgrid That's arrangement. So I think in remote areas, it can be particularly powerful. Yeah. Um, you know, in a four season climate, and I serve a lot of four season climate states, um, the challenge for us is in the winter time, right, dark. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the, the renewable or distributed power may not be there, and it may not be there for several days. So, you know, that, that's some of the complexity right, of right. going off grid. So you said there's no technology to replace nuclear that is low carbon. What about carbon capture with natural gas? Has so I think that's, that goes back to the carbon capture question. Okay. Sure. So a combination of carbon capture and either sequestration or doing something with the carbon would be uh, a base load equivalent carbon free load following uh, source of generation. We just don't have at scale operating carbon capture and sequestration in the US. So that's where research and development needs to go to work so that we come up with economic solutions. So with the rise of electric vehicles, what's their effect on grid resiliency? I think there's a lot of work going on with electric vehicles and uh, I think it's going to be increasing over time. I think it becomes a tool that can be used. Uh, so how do we use that battery mm -hmm. uh, during the day or when the car isn't running? And so mm -hmm. we have been piloting a number of things, uh, working with EVs and EV infrastructure. We're talking with a number of our cities who are interested in you know, larger charging infrastructure and figuring out how to put electric vehicles to work. So a lot of work going on uh, to make that resource really valuable. And to make, so to explain that more. So if you think about uh, the electric vehicle, it is a battery and uh, has a battery in it and that battery isn't always being used to run the car. So can it be used in some other way? Right. In the so home. What, okay, in the home. In the home. Okay. Or if it's sitting in a parking garage uh, during the day, is there a way to use that battery to balance load or to store energy to be discharged hmm. at a different time? Okay. So it's just, it's a mobile battery. And can we use it in a way that's that supports the grid? What do you think about the administration's push to maintain coal and nuclear generation on security grounds? Does keeping these plants running make the grid more resilient, especially to cyber attacks? No, I think the, uh, there's a lot more to learn about this topic of, uh, of resiliency and reliability. We care deeply about it because it's what keeps the power working all the time in all seasons, um, et cetera. And we will be engaged on the discussion of what resiliency means. I think it's a, an important topic. Um, it's a topic where the devil is in the details about what it all means. And I think we need to keep an eye not only on resiliency, but also affordability and the way we go about it. So mm -hmm. there's just more to learn on that topic. Energy is a historically male-dominated field. In your leadership, what is one of the main ways that you ensure equity opportunity to women? By the way, we had a conversation in the back about um, the numbers of women Fortune 500 CEOs, and you were saying that's actually not the case in your so industry. So in our industry, and Tom, check me on this, I think it's 22%. So 22% of the electric and gas utilities have women as CEOs. So far, far exceeds the Fortune 500. Yeah. And uh, you know, we had a conversation actually at the annual EEI convention on why that's the case. I'm not sure anyone knows exactly why it's the case, but it's an industry that for a long time has um, promoted a workforce that looks like the communities we serve. 
and there has been an emphasis on diversity uh, for a long time. Because you're tied to the community. You're tied, you're tightly tied to, to the, the community, community in a way that other, a lot of other companies aren't. I mean, it's a local part and business, even though it. we're yeah. big. There's yeah. a, you know, a local uh, element to it. And I, as I, I also look at the skills uh, of the CEOs that are in our industry, so engineering, of course, but finance and legal also. Um, dominate uh, the senior ranks. And those are fields that women have made real inroads in. Mm -hmm. And so I think the pipeline has been good. So we're proud yeah. that 22% uh, of the women are CEOs, of the CEOs are women in our industry. So going down the ranks in your workforce, uh, tell us about, with all this innovation, what kind, what, what kind of talent are you looking for? Are people, what kind of innovative talent are you looking for that Say in your linemen, that sure. you did, what do they have to know that they didn't have to know 10 years ago? They have to be more technology savvy because right. we're handing them an iPad yeah. and tools. And do you train uh, them or do you we do. expect them to go to college, community college? We train. Okay. We train. And so I think about talent as being an extraordinarily important resource for any company and for an industry like ours going through transformation, um, it's really important. So right. a workforce that can embrace change a workforce that is uh, uh, willing to undertake new things and new technologies, a workforce that's uh, willing to solve big, complex issues with creative solutions, who's willing to walk away from a bulk power solution and develop a distributed solution and introduce new technologies. It's hitting our industry at a time when we also have demographic change going on, so we have retiring, uh, a lot of retirements going on in our industry, and this is an opportunity for us to bring in new skills. It's an opportunity for us to focus on reskilling, mm -hmm. so technology in particular. And so we are about to open at Duke a, um, we took a, a, a facility that's in the hip part of Charlotte, the cool part of uh -huh. Charlotte. Uh, it's an old warehouse, it's called Tompkins Hall. And it is going to be completely devoted to design thinking, agile techniques, agile teams, operating in IT, working together to solve complex problems. And it will be completely suited to that. So you're not going to find desks. You're not going to find cubicles. Right. You're going to find lots of collaborative spaces uh, that employees can come together. I think that'll be um, a, a way to accelerate this cultural change mm -hmm. around innovation. And my hope is I've got the nuclear engineers in there, I've got yeah. the linemen in there, I've got the back office finance team uh, empowered with uh, some young uh, design thinkers who will make us better. Great, and do you, do you see job growth or kind of because of technology flattening? I think that's an interesting question, Nina, because it's gonna differ in different parts of the company. So there's no doubt we're going to drive productivity. Every industry must. We have to be more competitive, and that productivity will come in the form of you know, um, more productivity out of existing workforce. But in other areas, I think you're going to see a rise in uh, you know, technology skills. You're going to see a rise in the folks who are working on customer solutions. You're going to see a rise in the folks who are working on renewable operating centers. Right. So it's... Um, you know, it's kind of, uh, it'll be different across the business. So speaking of workforce, someone from the audience asked, does Duke have an apprenticeship program? We have apprenticeship programs. We have co-op programs. Um, we are working diligently uh, to keep a good pipeline of talent coming into the company. Is that hard? Uh, well, you know, I was just, what's in my mind, Nina, is one of the things I have been working on is uh, with other business leaders in the, in the Charlotte area, trying to develop a, um, a workforce development strategy for the 18 to 24 year old um, disconnected youth. They may have a high school diploma, but they have not yet found their way. So how can we help them find their way? So we are developing training programs uh, in two areas. For us, call center, working with uh, some of our other businesses in the Charlotte area. We're also working on developing a pathway for some of the healthcare facilities in our region. And you, you develop the pipeline through uh, some of the social service agencies who know um, uh, these, these potential employees. 
We train them and then we hire them on the back end. If they graduate, they have a job. And my hope and expectation is that we find new pipelines of people who can come into the company. And if you start in the call center at Duke, you have a chance to do many great things mm -hmm. and uh, move up and really create a, a career for yourself. So I think it's you know, workforce development in a tight economy with low unemployment uh, that is, has been a bit uneven right. from a recovery. Working on that, uh, that population is really important. Of course, important. you guys to offer skills and training. And yes, and we're and excited about the potential. Good. So this launches September 1st. Great. Yes. So renewables and new tech are great, but how do we cost effectively transition from the system we have and are still paying for? What, customers, what should customers expect regarding the pace of change? I guess in terms of moving away from a carbon, sure. you know, we heavier had, carbon econ economy. Yeah. So the so transformation is still underway, uh, and has been underway. So I think about the work that we've done to take 30 percent carbon emissions out over 2015 since 2005. I'm not sure our customers have noticed that in their bill because we've had the benefit of low natural gas prices. Uh, we've had the benefit of low interest rates that have been helpful. And tax reform, frankly, uh, is another potential reduction in the price of power that gives us an opportunity to continue to transform. So we've had some really extraordinary opportunities to lower price at the same time we're transforming. And we'll continue to look for ways to do that. So thinking about productivity, mm -hmm. at Duke Energy, we have taken almost a billion dollars out of our cost structure through productivity and through uh, working smarter, through um, you know, driving inefficiencies out of our business. Every dollar of, of um, corporate back office savings that I make means my customer's not paying for it. Right. And so uh, we care deeply about the price of power. We understand how important it is to our communities. And we are using tools like the ones I've just discussed to keep that price uh, as low as we can. So here's a security question. How is Duke partnering with communities and government agencies to ensure energy resiliency is delivered at critical facilities like hospitals and military installations in case of an emergency? Well, on military installations, there's a very tightly uh, knit uh, coordination with the military where their critical infrastructure is clear to me. I know I'm serving it and I know what those responsibilities are. And the same is true for hospitals. Uh, there is a, a direct communication that goes on in identifying what's critical so that we know and there's a priority on restoration. Uh, we also work with customers on backup power. So, you know, a hospital should have backup power. Uh, and so those kinds of relationships and discussions are ongoing. I think there's always uh, stories about vulnerability in that process where maybe a facility hasn't taken the steps of backup power and perhaps hasn't raised their hand is being dependent. We always learn uh, from these events on that, but that is an ongoing outreach and that's part of storm preparation as well. Let's make sure we know uh, where all those critical facilities are. So, I mean, you're, you're an industry that really has, you, it's sort of built into the industry that you're going to have crises and crises basically. It's you're going to have weather well, events, that's for sure. You're going to have weather events at the very, at the minimum. So, um, so far, what's been your most difficult decision that you've had to make in one of those situations? My. You know, Nina, I, um, I don't know that I could point to a single event. Um, you know, the, the things I would say to you in a crisis uh, that you're focused on is um, the customer, First of all, what are the customer's expectations of your communication and your service? Uh, you're thinking about your communities and government officials. What is their expectation and what is my communication? And then in terms of your response, have I done absolutely everything I know to do in order to address it? Um, and those are the, those are the you know, questions that you're asking. But it's a dynamic industry. And when you know everyone's counting on you 24 hours a day, seven days a week, all the time, there's a lot of pressure that builds up when something isn't working. Yeah. And we are deploying everything we know to do to fix it. And How do you uh, deal with that pressure with you and your, not just with you, but with your team? How do you approach pressurized environments? 
you uh, maintain your calm. Get your, you seem like you have a very yes. calm demeanor. And you so. maintain optimism. Okay. You project optimism and calm. But I'll tell you one uh, story during Hurricane Irma. So I was in between houses. Um, so we had sold our house and hadn't yet moved into a house. So I was living in an apartment um, the, uh, the weekend that Hurricane Irma was unfolding. And um, the, you're on the phone all the time, right? You're understanding where the, the estimated time of recovery is. You're understanding uh, the, st the st storm damage. You're understanding the crews. And it was one particular challenge is when you evacuate Florida for a hurricane and it's time to get the crews in to restore the power in Florida, what do you think the state of the roads are? Mm. So you have some logistical issues on yeah. how to get people where you are. So anyway, I, I am just wound tighter than a drum with all this phone call. I'm in this two bedroom apartment. My husband is sitting on the couch watching something and I think there's no place to go. There's no, no. So I walked the block of the, um, of the apartment complex that I was in for like two hours on the phone because I had this energy that I needed to burn off and I needed to you know, maintain the update. Yeah. So that's one uh, story of how you, uh, how you address the anxiety. I could have gotten in my car and driven to the office and it frankly didn't occur to me. <laughs> I was too busy on the phone walking the block. But, um, you know, you just care deeply about getting it back, yeah. right? I wanna, you want to get And you, you must feel helpless. It, like those of us who've lost power, you must yes. feel some level of, I mean, you, you know what's going on yes. and you know it will come back on, but that you can't make it come right, back on right it's, away. There's real work of, to do. Yeah. And I actually um, went the next day uh, down to Florida and had a chance to spend some time with the crews. And you appreciate the work that goes on. Uh, and you appreciate um, your team. It's how do you make sure, again, in a crisis, how do you make sure you're getting the right information? You want some information on the ground. Okay. Um, so I, you know, I think it, at times I sit on the 48th floor of an office tower in Charlotte. I'm certain that's not where all the best information is gonna be. Yeah. Uh, it's not in the newspaper. Yeah. Uh, your direct reports, the people who are responsible have some news, but I also think getting out of the office and talking to the people on the ground is really important. Um, and that has been a guiding principle, whether it's storm restoration or other things. I think it's important for you to be there, but you also get a better sense. And, um, you know, I'm always reminded about the big industrial operation that we run. When you watch linemen trying to restore power in a neighborhood where there's backlog construction of power lines. You can't position equipment. They're carrying 50 pound um, you know, equipment up a pole in 95 degree weather to work for an hour and a half to restore eight homes. Oh, yeah. You know, you appreciate sure. why that estimated time of recovery is, uh, you know, is difficult. And so when I lay eyes on it and I see what it is, it always helps me with my thinking. Last question, what piece of advice would you give to young women who want to pursue the heights of corporate America? Find something you love to do. Find something you love to do. And- uh, What do you love about this? Keep going. You know, I have always found this industry, I think it's an industry that matters. Mm -hmm. So it, it matters to me that it matters. The fact that people count on us 24 hours a day, I yeah. think that's pretty cool. Yeah. Uh, so it's an industry that matters, and it's actually an industry that's really hard. So the technology is hard, the operating is hard, the regulatory environment is hard. Um, and so there's so much to learn. And so I feel like I've been on a constant learning curve. Uh, but the other thing I would say to you is you're gonna find all kinds of bumps, so you have to keep going. So that's the other piece of advice. <laughs> Uh, always keep going. Well, Lynn, thank you so much. And um, words from the audience, please keep us safe. I'll do it. I'll do it. Thank you. Thank you. It's been a pleasure, truly.